This is the first part of a lecture on cellular aging, and particularly the effects of reactive oxygen species on cells with age from October 9th, 2020. And for this lecture, I'm going to focus on these um, objectives highlighted here in red. We're going to talk a little bit about the different types of damage that ROS or reactive oxygen species can cause to cells, particularly in terms of how they RAS can alter DNA, how um, ROS can alter membranes, both of the plasma membrane and membranes of organelles. And then we'll also talk about why ROS, even though it's so harmful, has not been selected against, and some advantages that um, reactive oxygen species confer to organisms. <coughs> and so ROS leads to the accumulation of damaged biomolecules. And those biomolecules might be the phospholipids that make up biological membrane. When ROS um, kind of damages those biomolecules, it can change membrane fluidity. When ROS damage DNA and RNA, it can lead to breaks in the sugar phosphate backbone. ROS can also damage proteins, right? Um, and if it affects DNA and RNA polymerase proteins, there can be errors introduced into the DNA and RNA molecules made by these enzymes. And ROS can also affect um, sort of the destruction or degradation of damaged biomolecules as well. And so ROS can actually affect the ubiquitin proteasome system, for example. And without this ubiquitin proteasome system or this protein degradation mechanism, um, proteins don't get degraded, particularly when they're damaged, which could lead to further damage and toxicity. Additionally, <coughs> the waste removal apparatus of the cell can be affected by ROS, which can lead to the accumulation of misfolded or damaged proteins. Right? And so ROS can do a lot of different things. It can damage proteins, it can damage nucleic acids, it can damage lipids. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of these specific things um, that ROS does to DNA as well as to membranes in the next couple slides. And so it's important to note that when we talked about ROS generation, really we focused on the ROS that were generated through aerobic respiration, which takes place in the mitochondria. But <laughs> most of the cellular damage or molecular damage caused by ROS comes from the cytosolic reactive oxygen species, which only make up about 15% of all the ROS generated in the cell at any given time. And so if we're gonna look particularly at the damage to DNA that ROS can confer, we have to look a little bit closer at the molecular structure of DNA itself, right? And so ROS actually has a very high affinity for this particular bond between ribose of DNA or RNA, between the sugar <coughs> and guanine nitrogen base. <clears throat> and what it does is it actually breaks this bond, which allows adenine to replace guanine in the DNA structure. Right, and so you can see this superoxide here, this ROS, breaking this bond between sugar and guanine nitrogen base, and adenine being substituted um, in as a result. And in the process, this guanine nitrogen base has to go somewhere um, and it generates this particular molecule here, which can actually be used, um, and you can see it here as 8-OH-deoxyguanosine, to measure the amount of ROS in cells, right? Because you can imagine that the more of this compound that's generated, the more reactive oxygen species are causing DNA damage, right? Because it's a byproduct of that reaction. And so in these control cells here, you can see <coughs> the deoxyguanosine in red, and the nuclei of cells in blue, stained with DAPI. And then there's a merged image on the far right, right? Um, and then if you actually treat cells with this compound that induces ROS generation, what you'll notice is that there's a dramatic increase in the amount of deoxyguanosine, which you can visualize inside the nuclei of the cells, as well as quantify, right? And that difference is pretty significant. And this is a common a mechanism by which you can measure ROS in, um, in cell culture. <clears throat>
And so in addition to kind of inducing these breaks and ch potentially changing the sequence of DNA by substituting guanines for adenines in the DNA sequence, ROS can also lead to the accumulation of <coughs> damaged lipids, which can really affect uh, your membranes, both plasma membranes as well as the membranes that encase the organelles within the cell. And if you remember back to intro biology, um, or remember that biological membranes are made of phospholipids and they're bilayers, right? And so the phospholipid structure has this negatively charged polar head group and then two fatty acid tails that are hydrophobic and extend into the center of the membrane here. Whereas these hydrophilic phospholipid or phosphate group heads face the outside environment or the cytosol, right? And these tails, the fatty acid tails, can be made of many different types of fatty acids. And the types of fatty acids really sort of determine the fluidity of the membrane in that particular location. And so sometimes these fatty acids are saturated or have the maximum amount of hydrogen atoms on each carbon, meaning that you see all single bonds here because all of these are saturated completely with hydrogens. Whereas when you, there are some types of fatty acids called unsaturated that have double bonds. Um, these carbons are not saturated with hydrogens and therefore they have to form double bonds with each other. <coughs> and unsaturated fatty acids tend to increase membrane fluidity because each of these double bonds induces sort of a kinked structure into the fatty acid tail. And the more kinked the fatty acids are, the more fluid or dynamic the membrane is. And the more saturated or straight the fatty acid chains are, the more stable the membrane is. And you can kind of see why that might be if you think about trying to stack a bunch of pieces of paper on top of each other. If you have a bunch of piece of paste, pieces of paper that are flat, like the chains of saturated fatty acids, they'll stack easily into a nice, even um, stack of paper, right? But if you try to crumple up a bunch of pieces of paper and you induce kinks or folds into them, and then you try to stack them, you can imagine that that is going to be a lot less stable and a lot more dynamic as a structure than a, than a stack of paper like this, right? And so these um, different types of fatty acids become relevant when we're talking about um, damage by reactive oxygen species because it's the polyunsaturated fatty acids or those unsaturated kinky fatty acid tails on phospholipids that actually get attacked by reactive oxygen species. So you can see here this ROS attacking this particular part of the polyunsaturated fat um, and it likes to attack basically these double bonded carbons, right? And in the process, it generates what are known as lipid radicals and then ultimately generates a compound called a lipid peroxide, which is harmful to the biological membranes. And that's because um, once you generate sort of one lipid peroxide molecule, you've also generated another radical, which can then initiate the further formation of lipid peroxides. And so there's sort of this cycle where once some lipid peroxides form, it becomes easier to generate even more of them through this process. But luckily your membranes actually have um, another component that can help fight this formation of lipid peroxides. And that is vitamin E. And so what vitamin E can do is it can actually reduce this um, radical here to form just a, to basically form it back from a radical, an oxidized radical to a normal um, polyunsaturated fat. And so vitamin, exists, vitamin E exists in the biological membranes near where this process might be happening to prevent the formation of lipid peroxides. Because not only can lipid peroxides kind of perpetuate this cycle, they actually create holes within the membrane, and then the membrane loses its integrity, um, and things leak in and out as a result. <laughs>
which is a big problem. Right? And there's another vitamin, vitamin C, that's actually involved in sort of combating the damage to membranes by lipid peroxides. And vitamin C acts in a process to basically regenerate the vitamin E that you need to stop um, lipid peroxides from forming. And so both vitamin C and vitamin E become essential to this process um, of stopping ROS from destroying your biological membrane. And so you might be thinking at this point, like, who even invited you, Ross? Like, why would we ever want to have reactive oxygen species within a cell if they're so harmful in all these different ways? If they can destroy membranes and degrade proteins and mutate DNA, then why would we ever want to generate Ross within a cell? Like, why would evolution have not um, kind of gotten rid of this mechanism by which Ross is generated? Um, and so under normal conditions, what you should know is that ROS is not generated, right? Um, because oxidative phosphorylation is active. And as we talked about before, really oxidative phosphorylation um, <coughs> and the making of ATP through aerobic respiration kind of depletes um, the formation of ROS. And in addition, there's a little bit of signaling that goes into this as well. So when ROS is not made, there is a particular factor called um, HIF1A that is degraded. And what HIF1A does is it actually provides a little bit of protection under hypoxic or anaerobic conditions when oxygen is low. And so when oxygen is high and everything is great and oxidative phosphorylation is happening, no ROS is generated. And HIF1A is degraded um, because there's no need to respond to that low oxygen environment. However, under hypoxic conditions, ROS are not made. Reactive oxygen species are not made, right? Because there's no aerobic respiration happening. And since ROS are generated in that time, Specific ones, like her hydrogen peroxide, actually act to inhibit the ubiquitination of HIF-1A. And ubiquitination is the thing that degrades stuff, right? And so if we inhibit the degradation of HIF-1A by inhibiting its ubiquitination, HIF-1A can be expressed, right? And it can actually um, promote expression of the genes involved in protective response to these low oxygen or hypoxic conditions. And so it seems like the generation of ROS during times of low oxygen and the generation of this hydrogen peroxide as a result actually activates this HIF-1A pathway and helps protect the cell. So it seems like there is a functional um, benefit to generating ROS, especially under hypoxic or low oxygen conditions because it triggers the protective stuff you need for the cell to survive those conditions. And additionally, ROS also serves as part of the immune response. They're often secreted by macrophages, which are large cells in the immune system, and they can degrade the membranes of inv pathogenic invaders like bacteria, right? Because we know that they're good at degrading membranes. We just talked about that. And so that's another kind of beneficial function that ROS have in particular cells and why you might want to continue generating them even though over time, an accumulation of ROS could lead to cellular issues and ultimately cellular aging.